Alternative Radio. A for Screen and Country special presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. My name is Jason McLeod. I'm here with my old pal, Brendan Wall. Hello, Brendan. How are you? I am well. Thank you for asking me. Rather standard opening here today. I uh, didn't feel right with the subject of the uh, movie that we're going to watch today to maybe go full out wacky. I'm no Jerry Lewis. I don't have that kind of talent. Yeah, Jerry Lewis, the most talented comedian of all time. Absolutely, this is correct in all his opinions. This is not, uh, yeah, every single one of them. This is not that Jerry Lewis movie that is going to come out this year, finally? Is that right? June, my friend. It's going to be screened in June at the Library of Congress in the United States of America. And folks, if you want to fund that trip, send your money to For Screen and Country. And Country. <laughs> just, just just one of them. For Screen and Country at gmail.com. But yeah, no, we're we're open to sponsorships from all sorts of corporations, uh, political uh, parties, uh, political parties, political groups, certainly uh, um, lobbyists, mm, lobbyists, uh, special interests. We're basically, if you have money and you want to give it to us uh, to allow us to go see this movie, uh, we'll say whatever you want yeah. and we'll do whatever you want. We have and no we'll morals. Whatever you want, no morals, no ethics. It's at this note I should. It's at at this point, uh, conveniently, Jason, that I should note that this episode is brought to you by the South African government of the eighties, folks. Oh wow, I didn't know they were still around in any form, <laughs> folks. They were misunderstood. No, that's terrible. That's terrible. End it now. That's very terrible. Forget it. That's very terrible. Forget everything that just happened. I've just uh, picked up my little Men in Black doohickey, and you've forgotten it. Pew! There. Done. Blah, blah, blah. Classic Men in Black. A baby blah, crying right blah, after. Blah. Jason, this is a podcast. Blah. Is it? It is. It's called For Screen. And Contra. And Jason, on this podcast, we are, have been talking about the top 100 war films of all time, according to the Wartime Establishment Paste magazine. Now, yes. we have been on a bit of a, a siesta from that. Um, that's not, that's the wrong word. Siesta means nap. You mean sort of a, a sabbatical? No. Nope. I think is a better word. No, nope. we've been sleeping. We've been sleeping. This is all a dream sequence. What's going to happen is oh, when we oh. go back to the list, we're going to be like, oh, oh, remember oh. all those movies we did, we covered? They weren't on the list. What were we thinking? And then it's it's going to tie into the other podcast. It's going to be like a David Lynchian kind of experience. That actually would be an interesting idea for a podcast. It's like a podcast about movies, but the movies are just movies from dreams. Or or I, th I thought you meant like the podcast about movies and the very last episode, they all wake up and it was all a dream. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, w w yeah. Well, th hey, look. There's, it's never too late. Someday this podcast will end, and if it's what? if it's mutually and and one of us doesn't die, um, then that's how we'll end it. And and it will be via murder if that happens. By the way, I mean, I have to assume. I'm assuming one of us is going to get assassinated for our very controversial political opinions on this show at some point during the Great yeah. Civil War of 2025. Hey, maybe we all shouldn't be such assholes to each other. Ba blam, ba blam. Yeah. <sighs> Take that, take that, uh, put that thought back in your pocket, sir. So sorry, siesta, uh, sabbatical, break, whatever you want to call it, Jason. We're we're taking a bit of a, an offshoot from this list, 
and uh, we're talking about some other things, some other war movies. We talked about some uh, some movies that were completely similar, but this week I thought, you know what? It's nominated for Best Picture. It's garnering up all these great reviews. We've talked about this director, Jonathan Glazer, twice before on this show, as we talked mm-hmm. about Under the Skin and Sexy Beast. And so why not? It ties into the war. It's a perfect time to talk about The Zone of Interest from, again, from director Jonathan Glazer, nominated for Best Picture this year at the Oscars, among a few other awards. Um, But at the time of this recording, the Oscars, I believe, have already happened. So maybe it won some stuff. We'll see. Is Jonathan Glazer related to Brian Glazer? I don't think so. Are they married? Uh, I mean, I don't know. They could, could okay. be. They could be uh, married cousins. They, they could be. They I mean, it's be. in America. In America. That's why you come to America, to marry I always wonder your why cousin. Brian Glazer was based out of Mississippi. Brian Glazer has a racer head hair. Just yeah. want to throw that out there. He's one of the few guys that can pull it off. I guess him and him and David Lynch. Really well, I was going to say, two. you don't think a racer head pulled it off? Well, he did, but but Jack Nance has been dead for quite... Is it Nance? Is that the guy, Jack, Jack Nance, Nance? yeah. Yeah, he's been dead for a while. Yeah, he got stupid real quick. For those of you who may have forgotten, st- when everybody dies, they get stupid. I wasn't calling him yeah. stupid for dying. Well, it, it, no, it's it's more that, that by dying, you prove that you're an idiot. Right, exactly. And you prove your ultimate stupidity. Only those of us who are alive are the smart ones. Mm, maybe we just made it worse. But let's talk about... The movie this week, Jason, The Zone of Interest, Jonathan Glazer. Um, you you pretty much alluded to the, this fact already, but this is uh, we didn't we didn't want to goof around too much right off the top because this is kind of a, a bit of a serious one. Um, why don't you yeah. uh, why don't you kind of uh, briefly summarize what this movie's about? And again, this came out just this past year. Well, first off, Brendan, I have to say, because you mentioned it, now that I think about it, um, this is a movie that's somewhere in between. At one end is a sexy beast, and at the other end is an under the skin. Sexy beast may be a more more conventional film, uh, uh, and under the skin, an extremely unconventional film, will plop zone of interest right in the middle between the two of them. Mm. This is a movie that is ostensibly about uh, kind of the life of one Rudolf Hess, not Rudolf Hess, the deputy Führer, Rudolf Hass, the uh, uh, commandant of the Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland during World War II. Now, now, now Jason, of just of course, real, he was a German. Real quick, just because we're going to say his name a lot, um, I'm not going to make the uh, effort to say Hass every time. Um, it's Hass. Hess. It's Hess. It's fine. Hess is fine, mostly because he's a Nazi and I don't care about offending him that's, or his that's estate. Fair. So I'm just yeah, going to call him Hess. Hess. That's okay. Fine. Cool. But uh, Mr. Hess or Commandant Hess or, no, I guess by the end of the movie, he's an Obersturmbenfuhrer. So Obersturmbenfuhrer Hess, uh, uh, yeah, he's, he's living a life. Now, this is a movie that focuses kind of on his home life, for the most part, uh, and those around him in his home life. And it is all against the backdrop, mainly, of a fence and the tops of buildings. What What's so cool about this movie is that this is a movie that tells one story while the horrors of the Holocaust play out in the audio track of the movie. Mm. You, in this movie, this movie is about Holocaust horrors, but you never see them. You only hear them. Because visually, what we are seeing is the perfect little life of Rudolf Hess, his wife, his four children, mm-hmm. uh, and their, uh, you know, their pioneering Lebensraum existence in the East. Mm-hmm. So Hess is obviously a successful member of the SS. He raised his way through the ranks. He was in the First World War um, and eventually became involved in the concentration camp system and was eventually promoted to the charge of Auschwitz. And in fact, I think he may have built Auschwitz. They, like he may have been the guy that helped establish it. They definitely, yeah, they it. they do allude to that in the movie too. Yeah, that he that he constructed or like engineered a lot of the stuff there. Yeah. So, as his privilege as the commandant of such a big camp, he has a house that's right near the camp. That he has personally built to his wife's specifications, and they live uh, essentially a pretty idyllic life, uh, except for all the sounds in the background. Uh, they've got a lovely garden. The kids get to play, and 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 they've got a beautiful river where Rudolph likes to fly fish. Um, his wife has a has a nice house to keep, and she has lots of local girls as servants, Polish girls. 
Yeah, I know you like it. I'm, I see you smiling. What? You love those Polish girls, don't you? Yeah, I don't. I, see I don't it. like with it. I don't like this, Jason. No, Brennan, I see it in your face. I know you love Polish. Girls. I was taking a sip of coffee. Yeah, and you did it in such a way that I knew what you were thinking about. I mean, listen, there's lots of. I'm sure there are a lot of pretty ladies from Poland. There is. Oh man, those Polish girls. Mm. Are you turning this into like a? Well, Polish girls are hip. I really dig those styles they wear. But the German girls with the hair tucked back, they keep me up when I'm out there. But I wish you know they all could be Hungary girls. You know, that's not what I was going for, but I'm so glad I got it. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you're glad. So we gotta keep movie, it. We gotta keep it as light as we can, Jason. This is heavy shit. Absolutely, we we have to try. You know, we, we, we don't make fun of of the victims. No, but no, we'll also absolutely not. Have fun and mercilessly mock Nazis. Because oh, by the way, did you notice Rudolph has a stupid haircut? Of course, I did. This fucking dumb haircut. This fucking fashy fucking haircut. And the worst part is those fucking haircuts are back. I've seen people wear that shit now. Mm. A lot of punk uh, bands. Ha- a lot of punk bands uh, yeah, wore that but, kind of haircut. But punk- but punk bands don't count because punk bands have been appropriating Nazi shit for many years, and generally it was anti-Nazi Sometimes. in nature. Although, I mean, we do certainly know there are Nazi punks who shouldn't really be called punks because they're not punk. No. They're fucking Nazis. Yeah. So, uh, and, and remember how, I mean, initially skinheads were not nazis and then yeah no there there are absolute no skinheads are like a working 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 class british subculture that was appropriated by nazis exactly just like uh Real sp- just like the uh that 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 frog that people like to put a gif or a oh, meme of i know um yeah uh a pepe yeah pepe yeah, was pepe originally and, just so, such an innocent thing he, exactly the guy who drew it just drew it as a thing and it became like a, and it's too bad because it is a useful it is a useful reaction gift but its association with neo-nazis makes it untenable unfortunately mm-hmm. there's a whole documentary <sighs> about it anyway mm. back to what you were saying that's that's pretty much the plot right we're just following this kind of this yeah. kind of him leading this idyllic life and really at the beginning just to Kind of put, uh, not a summary, but kind of a grand statement on this whole thing. I mean, clearly this movie is about the banality of evil at the end sure. of the day. Yeah, I mean, which, uh, uh, which on one hand, so many Nazi movies about this, but at the same time, this is an important concept in humanity that needs to be reinforced and reintroduced all the time to remind us that it exists and how easy it is to fall into uh, a system that perpetuates evil. I've never, I don't think I've ever quite seen it done in this way before. This is, yeah. this is, a, I mean, this is a movie that's only PG-13, but I would say that it is a scarier movie than like a good portion of rated R horror movies that I've seen in my life. This is a terrifying, deeply unsettling, mm-hmm. deeply disturbing movie. Like, like. Schindler's List was difficult to watch for sure. A difficult movie. I think this might even be more so. And and in Schindler's List, like you see like gory deaths, you see people getting shot, you see people getting tortured, yeah. you see people getting killed. This one doesn't show you any of it. And I, I yeah, I'm not, not to play comparisons or whatever, but I think this movie was even more disturbing than that. This is a movie that if you know nothing about the Holocaust, it's going to be pretty tense. If you know something about the Holocaust, then it is one of the scariest movies you may see. Um, And that's what's so interesting about this movie, that it's a movie that you do need some contextual knowledge to fill in about history, but ideally, you know, you have some of that. All you really need... Not a complete fucking... Yeah. But like you, but you know, you know, the idea of the ovens and, and how the Jews were burned in the ovens and, and then the, seeing the smokestack in the background and how the smoke pours out and the flames shoot out of it and everything. And then they get into the discussion later about the like patented rotating crematoria that, uh, you know, allows them to, to heat up and cool it very quickly so that they can keep the bodies going. And it's all, through. and it's all done with the coldest. Like yeah. most detached kind of filmmaking in a, in in a in the best possible way. I think it's extremely successful that it does this, but it is filmed in the in the coldest, most detached way possible. And I think I think this this to me 
This seems like a daunting task to it because this is based on a book and it seems like a daunting yeah. task to adapt this to a film. You're treading such a line. Brendan, I have to give my props to Jonathan Glazer because when he went and adapted this novel, he basically threw out the novel in a lot of ways okay. because and I'm glad he did because I, I've heard that this is a good book, but the the novel is centered on. So there's an officer who works at the camp. And of course, ha- uh, but ha- in the novel, the, the guy's name is Paul Dahl. It's based on Hess, but it's not named Hess, yes. right? It, yeah. So, it, yeah. so anyways, the, he's a he's the commandant of the camp, and he's his wife is there with their kids, and they're living there. And the officer starts to get infatuated with the um, the commandant's wife, and they start to develop a relationship. And the commandant starts to get paranoid about it so he gets one of his most trusted sonder commandos which is one of the 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 jewish prisoners at the camp that actually worked for the nazis and did stuff for them to basically keep an eye on them and then eventually he gets uh that sonder commando to kill his wife although he's not able to do it and it's like one of these things it's like yeah you could have made this into a movie and it probably would have been fine but it wouldn't it would just be like, well, what's the point? It's like a movie that what it, it it's like any other movie except everybody's in Nazi uniforms, right? This, yeah, like I feel like based on that plot. And of course, I didn't read the book; I just read the plot summary on Wikipedia. So take it for what you will. Mm-hmm. But it seems like this is a movie that clearly makes the choice to really bring the horrors forward, but also not forward. They're there, but they're not there. They're always there, and yet they're not. I mean, I think the closest we get to seeing anything and again we don't see anything but the closest we get to really being deep into that kind of that side of the fence or that side of the wall is there's a shot of i believe there's a shot of hess where we just kind of see like fog around him and we hear the screams and the gunshots more audibly is that the shot where he's like it's kind of like shooting up into the sky and you kind of see him from the chin up and he's wearing a helmet yes yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and you just hear all the fucking shooting. That's the thing that that uh, just throughout the movie, you will just hear random screams and gunshots in the most banal of scenes. It's like, oh, they're they're out in the garden and they're chatting and you just hear like ah, bang, bang, bang. It's like it's always happening. Yeah, it's mixed into the sound design so seamlessly yeah. that it almost makes you sick because at the beginning, you're listening to it, and you're like, oh, my God. Like, you're just so disturbed in there. And obviously, you're disturbed. You're hearing this throughout the beginning. But then, because it's in the whole film, you start to get mm-hmm. used to it, which then when exactly. you realize that, that you're getting used to it, makes you even sicker. Because you're yeah. like, they, they've, they've warped my brain so much that I'm just, like, accepting this as the normal. And maybe that's the whole thing where it's like, you know... Um, if this situation benefits me, why would I cha- yeah. make the the effort to change anything? Yeah, but we we could see how the difference because because in the movie, um, Mrs. Hess's mother comes to visit. Mm. While she's staying there, we see her have moments of just like it's clear that she's like uh, you know she's not against the Nazi. She was because she at one point it's like oh is 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 the Jewish lady I used to work for clean houses for in there maybe like, but. She gets up at night at one point and sticks her head out the window and is looking out and sees like the glow of the crematoria and hears the screams and just just a look on her face like like that she's going through it in her head Mm -hmm. because she's not used to this and it's starting to weigh on her. Even as much as she might be in support of it or or at least not opposed to it, she's getting a real taste. But for the rest of them, even the kids, they don't even notice it. Yeah, and I feel like her reaction is sort of similar to like when we talked about conspiracy and we said that some of the people in the room, a few of the people in the room, not to say that they oppose Nazism, but they certainly no. seem a little more <laughs> not into this whole extermination idea as some as they, much as they some. were like we have we have more practical ideas for Jews, so by definition we're slightly more humane than you who wants to kill them. Right. Now the kids is one thing that really I thought really was extra disturbing because it, it, there are some shots where um uh hess's son for example he like looks at the window at one point we don't see what he sees um or maybe we do we see someone do we see anything when he looks at the window? i thought we just heard stuff i think we just hear stuff yeah, yeah. he, he, he yeah, yeah, cause cause he's he like, hears it's like a 
It's like a guy being yelled at or something and yelling and yeah, we, we being, being threatened with execution and then executed, I think. Right. We see the subtitles on the screen and he's playing with his little like army soldiers at the time. Yeah. And then when he hears that, he goes back and repeats what he heard and acts mm. out the scene almost. But he, but he, these are children. You can't blame this little kid. No. I mean, he's so young and impressionable. And then um, another one that really sticks out for me is... Because you think in that scene, okay, he just hears these noises, thinks people are playing soldiers outside, it's all well and good. But they clearly understand, at least to some extent, what kind of threat there is because there's a scene later where the older brother locks him in the greenhouse and he makes a like sound as if he's like burning or something. Like gassing. To, yeah, gassing him to, to like to like scare him into thinking like, oh, I yeah. put you in the gas chamber. It's like, OK, that unlocks a whole new thing, because yeah. that means the older brother is well aware of what's going on over there. Well aware yeah. that it's that it's killing people. And the little brother knows enough that that's a bad thing to get caught in. Yeah. So. No, it's clear the older brother is because he's, you know, he's probably 13, 14, like he's and he's in the Hitler youth, obviously. So, and he's out there with his father, like, I think he's definitely, he knows what's going on because he's not stupid. He can see what's going on. And because of this whole national socialism thing, he's clearly into it. I think he's cool with it. Well, I mean, he is being, let's, let's be, let's be, let's be honest here though. He is being indoctrinated. This is not, uh, this is not uh, willfully following the, the, the the word of Hitler. This is, no, this is a kid. But this is what you did, right? This is the kid. He's in the Boy Scout equivalent, which was the Hitler Youth. And uh, when you're a when you're a little fascist, you know, you get big fascists telling you what to do, and it's, that's how fascism works. Yeah, I, I I'm really glad that fascist babies never got off the ground, though. <laughs> Jim Jim Henson. Yeah. I don't know what you were thinking with that one. He was. He, I think he wanted to make a point, but the network didn't get <laughs> the it. They, they never did, man. They never did. Friggin' ABC. His only defender, Paul Verhoeven. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he would be the one that would make that. Yes, I think it's very nice, and you should do this because I think if we have a movie on the TV, then uh, uh, we make the children feel bad about themselves. <laughs> Paul Verhoeven's films famously fascist. It depends on who you talk to online. Uh, I mean, <laughs> don't even, don't even be start with that. <laughs> if people can't see the parody of Starship Troopers, I'm just, I'm sorry. This is going to be. Usually, you know, people are a little, uh, you know, not as direct as this with 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 answers. But if you can't see the parody in Starship Troopers, you, my pr- my friend, are a fucking idiot. Yeah, and I mean, and it's it's not like it's something that the director has occasionally left open to interpretation. He's been very clear. <laughs> it's right. It's that <laughs> he set out to make an obvious satire. It's not subtext. It's text. No, it's text. It's right yeah. there. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, the background, the background. The back, the din of the no- background noise, like, and it's just, it's over the most mundane things. Like we're seeing, like, uh, Mrs. Hess putting on lipstick. Um, they're just making dinner, they, and there's no reaction. There's no like, oh, like a jump or anything when they hear things. They just carry on like nothing's happening. Yeah, yeah, and we see a couple of moments of the kind of because you know we we get that Hess is inherently cruel he's the commandant of a of a murder camp and he's very good at what he does and he's built this thing from the ground up so it's not like they need to show us going out him going out and shooting people or doing anything particularly evil we see him with his kids and stuff but his wife we don't have that context so we do get a few moments of her acting like a maniac uh one when she yells at that her one of her staff members simply because there was some water on the floor and she threatened to like, she basically essentially threatened to have her thrown in the, in the incinerator. I can, my husband could turn you to ashes. Yeah. 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 And that's, so I had a question here um, while I was watching the movie. So these servants are not people that were in the camp that were brought over. Are they? Brendan? Are they? They're local Polish girls. Okay. Don't make me sing it again. <laughs> because at one point, the um, I think mom, I think uh, grandma says like, "Oh, do you have Jews working for you?" She goes, "No, we don't have Jews. We have local Polish girls that work here." Okay, because yeah. that's that's what my thought was. It was like, "Oh, these are like the quote unquote lucky ones that don't at least don't have to be, uh, you know, in the camps." But of course, later we'll see that Rudolf Hess is uh, not shy about fucking one of them in his own office. No. Uh, clearly, and and from what I can see, seemingly underage. Oh, well, on top of that, I don't know about that. very she young looked, uh, looking. She looked, 
I mean, if she's young, she's rough. I mean, Jason, this was nineteen. This was nineteen forties uh, Germany. Not a not a fun time mm, to be alive. Mm. That's true. That's true. It's not like there was a lot of makeup available at this time. Yeah, makeup was in short supply. Um, but I mm. I just thought, like I thought. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought. I, that's what I had thought the whole time. It's kind of like. Um, well, I don't know if this is a good comparison to make, but it's kind of like when when I watch like a movie about um, like slavery in the South. And you see, like s- some of the some of the slave owners have some of their slaves in the house working, and yeah. some of them are like, "Well, at least I'm not in the fields. Like, at the least I'm get to yeah. be in the house." Like, I kind of thought that was the idea, where like, "Oh God, at least I'm not in the camp." But yeah. it, well, you've, you've, I mean, you could look at it for the for those Polish girls. You could look at it from the perspective, of, "Well, at least I'm not having to be like a prostitute for the German army." Now, do you think like so? So are these? And this is me just being ignorant to history. So are these girls in this position just as likely to be killed for no reason than anyone else? I mean, they're Polish civilians, so you know. I, I always know the, the the Wehrmacht wasn't particularly um, discreet about who they went about and killed. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if they just were more likely of being outright killed, but you know, they're local women, and like I say, they're not having to do sex work. So. And are they forced into this? Um, they sure don't look like they're happy about it, but they're doing it. I mean, that's the thing. If the occupiers come in and tell you this is what you do, well, you, that's pretty much what you got to do, right? So, it, but, but would this be, like, I know when we watched, uh, this is just turning into an interview. Um, I know when we watched <laughs> Black Book and I was, and we were talking about, like, how certain people, like, the certain people that were, quote, unquote, aligning with the Germans would, um, su- some of them would suffer a pretty similar fate after the war. So would, these girls would not fall under that umbrella, would they? Of people that would be like, I mean, were they like they're aligning with the Nazis? That's the thing. I don't know how that. Well, because you're. It's one thing. Because there's a difference. Like collaboration is is obviously, it's not exactly black and white. Yeah. But, I mean, if from my view, if you're just like staying, if you know, you're doing what you can to stay alive, and in that situation, working as a servant makes you some money and keeps you alive. I mean, I don't know if I call that collaboration. But if you're like actively involved, if you even as a servant, if you were actively you know, supporting the ideology and the people, mm-hmm. then maybe you're then maybe you are a collaborationist. I don't know, man. It's it's a tough thing. But also, whether you were or not, it's it didn't matter. It was whether people thought you were or not. So they b- could have been in danger at the end of the war for having worked for the Nazis. Why not? I mean, like if I'm thinking back to that scene where she was covered in like excrement in black book yeah. remember when they when they yeah. caught her and they said well you you're clearly in line with these people and it's like well the, was she though she wasn't really collaborating yeah. um i i i got to give i got to give major credit to this movie too for not trying to make anyone the slightest bit sympathetic like i have seen many a movie where and, and i'm just saying this though i have seen many a movie or a few movies at least, where, yeah, you have a Nazi a Nazi character who, you know, maybe, you know, there's something about this guy. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I've seen movies like that where they, they give these mm. horrible people just something, one little thing to latch on to. And sure, you see that Rudolf Hess is like, you know, I guess he's fairly good to his family, but... He seems to love his kids. He's happy to go out and play with them and take them out in the river and stuff. Like, that's the thing, is that, that there is some basic decency there from that perspective. But they, but they do it in a way... They still do yeah. that in a way that's detached and cold. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think the main way they do it is you never have a close-up of their faces. Have you, did you notice that? We never get that close. Oh, Except for that one shot in the fog, which I think is the reason, because the fog is kind of distorting it a little bit. But you never yeah. get a close-up. It's all medium yeah. shots, wide shots, really long shots. Yeah. Even when they're in bed, the, like, the camera's pulled back, and it's like looking at both of them in frame, talking across the gap to each other. Yeah, it's almost like the ca- even the, the camera is like, we don't want to get that close. Like, we don't want to bring you in that yeah. much. I also found it interesting that they brought in him fucking his like staff into it because it's like, well, the guy's already pretty terrible. Do we really need to bring that in too? But it's like, well, maybe at that point, because he doesn't, I don't know that, I I don't remember Hess doing anything outright like visually horrible in the course of this movie. I don't, like, he doesn't kill anybody, doesn't do anything, and I'm wondering if that was just one last thing to just remind you that he's a bad guy in case you had, like, drifted. Sorry, you talked <laughs> about the part we discussed earlier with the Polish girl? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, where he fucks her. It's near the end of the movie, right? 
It's, it's, I think in a, when he was in the process of being transferred or something. Well, e- even then, we don't see um, the act. We just kind of see the implication and the setup. What's interesting there, too, is like in any other movie, if this, if this movie did not have the backdrop of the Holocaust, if this movie wasn't about that and it was just about a guy who's working at his job, has to relocate despite his success in this area, his wife and kids are upset, he's, he's, miser- he's kind of miserable about it, and he ends up cheating on his wife. Like That's, that's, like, a, that's like a Douglas Sirk melodrama. Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, even, yeah, if you stripped out the Holocaust of it and the Nazi of it, I mean, I think it would still be an interesting movie. Obviously, would not have the same impact. No, I mean, <laughs> that this does. It's a completely different. I'm just saying this story works in a regular no, setting. I'm, sure. Well, what I'm saying is that if you had even this sort of movie, like the very kind of static, like approach, like looking at a guy going through his life. And the, and the depressions of that life. And, you know, you would have a, a movie that would be more Mike Lee and less Jonathan Glazer. But, oh God. you know, it would be it would be, you know, it would be there. But then again, this is a unique thing, I have to say. Did you notice, Brendan, like so far as I could tell, the camera only moves once or twice during the movie. I only noticed it once. Oh, OK, specifically. where did you notice it? When she's running down the street and the camera tracks alongside her, when when she's run, I think it's after uh, she finds out that they have to transfer. I think there's she runs out. Okay, she runs out to the street and the camera tracks along as she's running along the wall after him. I think there's maybe two or three times, but it's like the same kind of idea. Like I think because I think there's yeah. a shot where he's just walking alongside. And make no mistake about it, we need to. We should be clear on this. Their house is on the other side of the gate. Like it's right there. You see it's the, gi- the first thing. <laughs> you see the giant. You can see wall. the houses. Yeah, yeah. You see the wall. You see the barracks and stuff. Like just for over the top, you could see the chimney of the crematoria. Yeah. Oh man. And the other thing, I think another part that really, really kind of disturbs. Um, there's scenes like you mentioned the scene where we see the smoke and we see the fire and everything from the crematorium. The scene where the scenes where we're seeing people coughing from the smoke. Like, mm-hmm. and I'm not talking about people like in the camps. I'm talking about like people like the like the Germans and like their families. Like, there's a, there's a woman out who's sitting outside, starts starts coughing and go, goes back inside. And it took me a second to be like, oh, okay, she, they're saying she's sick. And I'm like, oh my sweet Jesus, no! They're saying that she's coughing because of the smoke from the fucking bodies that are burning in the concentration camp. Yeah, and and oh. sometimes you will see what looks like snow on screen, and there's a chance that's not snow, that's ash. I mean, not to mention we have a scene where they're in the pool, and he pulls out a fucking skeleton, like a, a piece of like bone. He's in. They're in the river. They're in the river. Yeah, not the pool. Sorry. And he and he realizes what it is, and he runs over to his kids. He's like, "Get out of the river! Get out!" And doesn't tell them what's up, and just gets them to get in the boat. And he walks through the river and hauls them like a good dad. Mm-hmm. Good dad that he is. Good dad, Rudolph has. Oh God! Don't isolate that audio clip. <laughs> Please don't. No, but and, and then there's so there's so many layers to that to that moment because you're like, well, okay, if you were again, take yourself out of the situation. If you were in the lake and you saw like a body or you saw something very unsanitary in the water where your kids are playing, clearly you'd be like, get the fuck out, get out, get out, get out, get out, and get try to get them out. Yeah. So that part, yeah. But also you have to think like, okay, also think of how insanely racist uh, the Nazis are or, you know, towards the Jewish people, insanely bigoted. And there's another layer to that. There's just like, oh, yeah, I'm sure in his head he's thinking not only is this a, a skeleton, this is a Jewish skeleton. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And on top of that, this is via him. Like this is <laughs> this is directly the, he's directly the reason for this this yeah. is not uh, that skeleton yeah that skeleton in the river is deli- directly due to his work so yeah yeah it's just oh it's it's so everything about that mm-hmm. um yeah, and uh when we talk about the uh the just the regular like staff meetings they have that are handled very like straightforward. Like it's yes, we're going to bring over this many on the train and then they're going to come over and we can burn this many per hour. And they, they talk about it as if it's just like, yeah, it's business. yeah we just have to have a staff meeting at five o'clock guys. Just talk about the latest uh, TPS reports. Like, yeah, it's, it's very much in the vein of conspiracy of it all sounding very dry and bureaucratic. Cause it is that's, and that goes back to that banality of evil idea that, yeah, it's like, they could be talking about moving crops. 
Or they could be talking about moving people. Yeah, it feels it feels because they 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 ground it so much in reality. That's what makes it feel so much more, you know, real and scary. Mm. This is not, um, you know, this is not. It's that movie we watched <laughs> where uh, the the girl's revealed as a Nazi and she goes on this crazy tirade. Oh, that was in uh, Fatherland. Fatherland. <laughs> this is not. This is not Fatherland where you know Rudolph Hess is like. When then they they were ashes in the sky, <laughs> like this is, <laughs> and it was because of me that was my work. I am what hath God wrought. Yeah, somebody needs to make a. Well, you don't need to, but I just think of a the, that Vince McMahon gif. It's me, Austin, but it's <laughs> Hitler's face instead. That's what it felt like to me. Like it was me all along. That's literally yeah. the tone of that scene in Fatherland. Like it's, so, I'll never forget that, Jason. It's the most ridiculous thing I've seen in a while. It was pretty, pretty, pretty terrible, and and pretty like <laughs> insulting too. <laughs> like that they that yeah. they're like, mm, are they gonna know that Nazis are evil? We better make sure they know. We better lay this out just so people don't, you know, question at all. We just gotta have it straight there from the horse's mouth. Yeah, yeah, even. This and this movie really makes you like. Did, I don't know about you, but it it made me kind of disgusted with myself, in a way, because I'm like I, I'm I'm just kind of watching this unfold, and you're kind of helpless. I know it's a movie, but yeah. you know what I mean. Like it's, it just feels like, um, it just feels like when when people don't fucking speak up about shit, and that's why a lot of shit happens because people people could make the effort to do something, but it's easier to not do something. You know, uh, what I did was uh, I didn't want to feel helpless, so I grabbed my TV, I hauled it up by the root, okay. and I hawked it out the window, and I said, fuck you, Nazi. Um, so how, uh, so did you get a, another TV afterwards? Yeah, yes. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Was it was it money I didn't have to spend that I had to spend? Mm-hmm. So I, in retrospect, it wasn't the it wasn't the smartest thing to do, but I think morally it was the right thing to do. Folks, for screen and country at gmail dot com, send your money so you can replace Jason's uh, uh, Nazi uh, Nazi motivated destruction of his television. <laughs> yes, my TV died for a good cause, and I need the world to step up and replace it for me. <laughs> I believe I'm gonna, I'll, I'll sing your campaign song. It won't make sense, but just go with it. I believe the children are our future. Fix Jason's television. Jason doesn't like the Nazis like Tobey Maguire. Just kidding. He hasn't announced yet. I'm just anticipating. Any day now, he's going to finally tell the world if he is or not. Jason, I'm going to tell you right now. If I ever get famous enough to like mingle yeah. with celebrities, I'm going I'm yeah. to record it. I'm going to go right up to Tobey Maguire and be like, can you please tell the camera if you are or have ever been a Nazi, and then I will no longer be a celebrity that day. Do you want to be like the Andy Joe McCarthy? You want to be going around Hollywood and and uh, <laughs> getting people to name names? Well, you know what though, I think that will be. I think that one might be more uh, favorably looked at than the Joseph McCarthy one. You heard it here first, folks. It's uh, the Black Scare is coming to Hollywood, and when I say black, I mean fascist. I'm, I must be clear about that. Yes, you have to be with with today's uh, lack of context. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you or have you ever been a Nazi or involved in the Nazi party? Uh, it, I'm I'm only 28, Mr. Chalamet. Answer the question. Look, I go to lots of parties, and <laughs> I mean, if one's a Nazi one, how am I supposed to know? Harry, tell the truth. <laughs> I once dressed up as a member of the Africa Cool, but that was it. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, you remember Prince Harry, what he did? Anyway. <laughs> he dressed up as a member of the Africa Cool. <laughs> And he dressed up like a Nazi at a costume party. Uh, that's th- that's the Nazi he dressed up as. Oh, okay. Sorry. A member of the Africa, because he was wearing like a khaki outfit with a Nazi armband. Oh. I don't know if it was combat appropriate, but... Yeah. I mean, you know what? Just just don't dress up like a Nazi for Halloween. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Save that for your reenactment weekends with your buds. If you want to dress up as SS soldiers, go find a reenactor group and hang out with a bunch of guys whose politics are extremely questionable. Oh, and can we talk about like just br- just for a second when he's in the water and he's wearing that fucking SS bathing suit? You f- suit you fucking Nazi knob. It's like well, and I look at it. It's like that's kind of a nice looking tank top as far as like design, but also it's SS runes, so mm. I wouldn't wear it. 
But also, you got to understand, he's in the military. So, like so many boys in the military, even today, much of his wardrobe is from the military. Mm-hmm. And when I say military, I mean the SS, which is not technically military. It's a paramilitary organization because it was not a national army. It was a political army, really. It was it was the armed wing of the Nazi Party, as well as the political wing and the. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, 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 sure. I also want to briefly mention that a lot of the conflict, um, again, because a lot of the d- direct conflict has nothing to do with the Holocaust going on in the background, but um, a major source of the conflict is that he has to move, he, he's going to move away potentially because all his hard work has paid off and now they want to move him to another camp and he's very upset about that. And uh, yeah. and his, uh, I thought you were going <laughs> to, for a second I saw your expression, I thought you were going to say, understandably. Well, I mean, kind of like, I mean, if, if from the from the cold perspective, practical perspective of you spent your you spent a good portion of your life working your way up through the ranks of something. Okay, let's just say this is not something big. This is not this is a, a detached from Nazism for a second. Yeah, yeah, no, but that's what I'm saying is that, yes, you understand why somebody would be reluctant to leave because they put so much of their heart and soul into something. Oh, and for his wife, I know, and but for his wife, who also has built their home there, that she's got this house that's built her specifications. She got this garden that is gorgeous, except for the, you know, the fucking wall that's through it and the barbed wire and the concentration camp behind it. But otherwise, it's very pretty. Is there a moment when someone is shoveling ashes onto the garden? Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. There, there was a, put ashes there's a, to help fertilize. I was going to say, I think they're literally using these ashes to fertilize the yeah. garden, which is yeah. just another another layer. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, I got to ask you to, uh, they mentioned something called Operation Hess. Do, do you know what that is? Operation Haas, the deportation of Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz, May to July 1944. So yeah, they do mention that in the movie. So yeah, that was a real thing that uh, okay. he's involved with. See, Interesting, interesting side note about World War II. Um, so our second with war the United, ever. Our second war, uh, absolutely. Well, so with the United States, um, I don't know if they did this during the Second World War, but in the years since, at least, when it comes to naming operations, they use essentially random names, and uh, uh, which makes sense. Like it, it's like Operation Badger. Of course, it should have nothing to do with badgers, or or you should not be able to apply anything from it. And the reason they do that is because during World War II, the Germans didn't do that, and the Germans would often name their operations with names that you could infer stuff about the operation from the name. Mm. So like, it might be like operation wolf hunter. And then it's like, okay, well that's probably to do with sub submarine related stuff. Okay. Or, you know, uh, operation Haas might have something to do with Rudolph Haas. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, that's just an interesting thing that I, I find fascinating. You know what I find fascinating, Jason is the way this movie ends because it doesn't it like like any other movie we don't really get um like like any other movie you know you'd get like a some kind of big conclusion wrap up thing that would you know maybe maybe the 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 allied troops close in or something but we don't get anything that uh you know fake dramatic or anything it's nothing so satisfying. We don't get to see him hanging in 1947, uh, executed for his crimes. No, but we do end it by kind of flash forwarding in a very haunting kind of moment. That we mm-hmm. we flash forward to the museum, the very real museum that exists, where you see like the shoes, all the shoes that they have in that exhibit, and the coats, and all this, st- and all the pictures of everyone, and just like these museum cleaners. Because he's in the same building that would later become that museum, Rudolf Hess. And then the ending of the movie, and I'm thinking, I watched a documentary a while back called The Act of Killing. And I feel like they pulled this from The Act of Killing because in that movie at some point, spoiler alert for this documentary, folks, sorry. But in that movie, uh, in that documentary, one of the guys who committed all these genocides just starts dry heaving at the end of the movie. Like he, he... He's the only one that start. It's you can tell like the shit is starting to affect him in the documentary, yeah. and he starts dry heaving. And as he's like kind of coming to realizations, he just he can't stop. Like he's just dry heaving, yeah. dry heaving, driving. And people have commented, it's like his soul is literally trying to escape his body. Like it's like mm-hmm. it's like this is his soul's realization. Like holy fuck, I gotta get out of here. And that's kind of what they do in this movie. Where he's like he's literally dry heaving in the steps, like Rudolf Hess is like almost like yeah. almost like puking. I mean, you can say yeah, yeah it's the, probably the smoke, obviously, is part of it. But I think that's I think it's a reference to that movie, be, uh, because it's a similar kind of, you know. Yeah, 
I don't know if it's specifically a reference to that movie, but that was kind of the thought I had that because he starts, he's walking down these very like similar looking stairs and he stops, he throws up a little bit. He walks down the stairs further. We cut to this scene in the future at the Holocaust museum. And then we cut back and he moves on. He like kind of, he coughs a little more, spits out and moves on. And in my mind, that was like a brief for him. That was a brief flash of humanity in his mind mm. that that uh, that overwhelmed him for one moment. Yep. But quickly he was able to pat it all down, tie it all back up, pull himself up, and be ready to go about being a fucking Nazi and continue his work. You're right, because I think ostensibly any human being starts off their life with humanity. And I think Absolutely. It, nobody nobody's born evil. No. And I think throughout you know, throughout the years, things happen to make that better the same or worse, you know, to kind of quash that. And clearly this is a man who's been indoctrinated probably since he was young, since he was a baby. I'm not giving him an excuse. I'm just saying this is a person who's probably been, you know, following a certain line of thought for a long time. Well, let's, let's be clear. Hess is not a young guy. Hess was served in the first world war. Yeah. Uh, I believe after the se- after the First World War, he joined a Free Corps. So his pipeline from from armed goon to Nazi is pretty clear. Um, yeah. So he's you could you could argue that he's been subject to some sort of propaganda since he was a child, since he grew up in Imperial Germany. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, again, Jason, he was I'm, a, I'm, he's an old guard Nazi. He's yeah. got a chevron on his arm. He's been there. He's got a party badge. He's been there since the old days. And, and again, just to be super clear, I'm not saying. This is his excuse. Like, fuck that shit. He's a Nazi. But I'm just saying, like, stuff happens. You know, over the years, he gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And I think you're right. I think in this moment, it's like the one moment where it's like, oh, shit, what are we doing? And he can't and almost can't handle it. But then he's just like, no, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I I don't think this is necessarily the case with Hess. In fact, I would argue it probably isn't. But for some people, I'm sure it was like it was almost like a sunk cost fallacy at a certain point. that They kind of had to ignore the bad things that were going on because they think to themselves, well, I'm already this far in. What am I going to do? Stop it. I got to just keep going and, you know, I'd, do what I got to do. And if we lose, then I guess we're fucked. So we got to win. I mean, at some <laughs> point, at some, at some point, it's the point of no return for better yeah. or worse. Well, not for better, but for worse, it's the point. It's the point of no return. Now, yeah. the bravest thing to do would be to just fucking turn on your own army and sacrifice yourself do it trying to do something good but i mean uh, it's either that or go along with it yeah. keep going mm-hmm. on on one hand the most practical thing you could do if you opposed it uh, at that moment could probably be just grab a pistol and kill yourself that's true but i think that's also that would also <laughs> be seen as like well that i don't know i don't know if that would be yeah. seen as super heroic either <laughs> no no maybe not <laughs> certainly wasn't for the fuhrer no, that was no. But the the on the list of heroic deaths that ranks dead last. <laughs> um, yikes. <laughs> uh, any other any big things you want to uh, cover before we uh, take our break? Mm, no, I think I'll uh, I'll bring it up in the notes section. All right. Well, we're gonna uh, talk about some of our other assorted thoughts and our bits and bobs, and we will be uh, right back. Age of radio. Jason, I don't think I don't feel a song is appropriate this week, so let's just let's just get into it. Good call. We I can't believe we didn't talk about this yet. How did we not talk about the four minutes of complete uh, darkness and sounds that we hear? It's like it's like an it's like um what do you call that in like old movies? An overture. overture. Yeah, light the lights. Yeah. This is here at the heights. Yeah. And and now and around. It's time for the zone of interest. But they didn't do that, thankfully. But no. yeah, it was a it was an overture of 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 terror, an overture of dread, an overture of just pure awfulness. It's 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 one of the best scores I've heard in a little while, though. I will say it's very effective and the fact that it's not used all the time it's used sparingly like otherwise we get you know, like we said we talk about the background noise that we get the awful awful background mixing well very well done background mixing but awful sounds 
Um, to the point where this, this this is so uncommon that I actually messaged you and I was like, Jason, don't think there's something wrong with your copy. This is how yeah. it starts. <laughs> because yeah. I almost thought there was something wrong with my copy. He's like, there's no picture on the screen for four minutes. Like, where else do you yeah. have you seen that in a movie made, like, after 1965? I feel like I've seen it on occasion, but but not very often. You would ex- like I wasn't. I should say I wouldn't expect Usually it. Not f- that long. I, yeah, no, I wouldn't expect it from most. I w- wasn't as surprised uh, when when I knew it was Jonathan Glazer because you know he does kind of outside the box stuff with his with his filming. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we also have in the movie. We I thought it was a dream sequence at first, but I don't think it was. There's a character named Sophie who I think is one of the girls that works in the house. And she's going out at night and seems to be, like, spreading apples around, maybe? So, that is based on a real person. Um, yes. Jonathan Glazer met this girl, uh, met, met this woman. She was uh, around, I think she was, like, 90 when he met her. And she was a real Polish girl who really went to the Auschwitz camp and left, like, oats and stuff and just snuck food into the camp. And she was never caught. Um, and, you know, she lived till she was 90. She died, like, shortly after he met her. But he, uh, but but yeah, she she was she's kind of a you know that's c- kind of a very heroic kind of person that did to, to do something like that. It's insane. And the, the 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 way and of course, what's interesting about the way those scenes are shown is that it's like um it's like a photo negative. It's like a night vision, uh, security camera footage almost. And the reason he did it like that is because because he's a huge fan of two thousand two's roller. N- how dare you? It looks <laughs> far better than that. <laughs> That's true, it does. Um, no, the reason he does it like that, and I don't know if you notice this throughout the rest of the movie, Jason, they don't really use lights. There's no lighting to, no. to speak of. It's all outside. So it's all outdoors. Natural. natural. There was a reason for that, wasn't there? That he didn't want to, he didn't feel like he wanted to aestheticize Nazis. So He didn't want to make them look like good. Lighting it. Yeah. Yeah, and so he just stuck with natural light, which ironically makes this movie look very good. <laughs> it, it does, but it makes it makes it look good in the way that that he wanted it to look like it doesn't it yeah. he he accomplishes his goal of not making because he he even said like he's like i was always very aware that there's a lot of american movies about nazis where they they look like for lack of a better word cool like yeah. you see their uniforms look Absolutely. good they're the the camera angles are like very like snazzy and it, like it make them look authoritative and he's like i did i wanted nothing to do with that i wanted to make them look mm-hmm. drab and lifeless and soulless like they actually are and and yeah, like you said, the reason for the lack of lighting was because he didn't want to make them stand out. He didn't want to make it look yeah. like he also didn't want to make it look like a movie. That's the other thing, too. There are scenes from far away, like these really long wide shots where he didn't even tell them he was recording. He had like 10 cameras yeah. on the go at all times. I believe the, the quote was he had it set up like a Nazi big brother. Yeah. And they just had cameras all through the house and they would just let them be able to walk around and, and act. 800 hours of raw footage, Jason. Wow. That's a lot of footage, Brendan. I, I feel for those poor editors. 800 hours. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. That's like, it's like a, some documentaries, they don't even get 800 hours of footage. No. For God's sakes. No. What else do I got here? Oh, did you notice that the old boy, uh, the older boy, has a a collection of gold Jewish teeth? Oh, I didn't notice that. He's in laying in his bed and he's like playing with some stuff, and the little brother like looks up to see what he's doing, and it's all like gold teeth oh. from that were pulled from Jewish skulls. Oh yeah. God, yeah, pretty fucked up. And huh? again, I know the older brother's thirteen; he knows better than the younger brother, but it's still, he still doesn't really fully understand. I don't think. Yeah. Well, and and that because then we see the bit later too where it falls into because clearly they're getting stuff from the concentration camp. I don't know if that's supposed to be allowed or not, but they're it's a grift that I think any camp commander probably runs. We saw it, the good the bad and the ugly. It's what Angel Eyes was up to, right? Yeah. He was grifting the people in the camp. But here they were dying, so they had all this shit that theoretically should be property of the Reich, but you know everybody has their fingers in the pot. So they're getting some Jewish teeth and then we have um she brings out a, some cl- baby clothes. And sets them down on the table for the the serving girls and says, you each can take one. And then at some point later, we hear, I don't know if she's talking to her mom or whatever, being like, oh, yeah, we got them from the Jews. We gave some Jewish uh, clothes to the girls. That's the thing. They don't even, like Sandra Hewler, who's great in this movie, by the way, as as is Christian Friedel. They both do a a tremendous job. But she never even, they never even for a second make you think that she's not completely complicit in all of this. 
No. Like, there's no moment no. where it's like, well, I'm not. I'm, I'm sure there's no killings over there. Like, there's nothing like that. She's very much like, yeah, these are the clothes from the people that we burned. She, because, and absolutely, she is 100% invested. She believes in the in the propaganda. She believes in the ideology because when he is, you know, transferred, she's arguing to him like, this is Lebensraum. We're out here. We're the pioneers. We're, we have our living space. We are like representative of everything the Reich wants. And you want to take that away from us? Like, yeah. We're living the dream. We are we are the fascist like like ideal right now. What happened to her? I know he was executed. Did anything happen to his wife? Well, I don't know a whole lot about what her life was like, but from what I can find out, she actually lived until 1989, so she uh, got to be 81. Hmm. One of his daughters, um, you'll be uh, sad to know, never really changed her ideology because later on she. His uh, his his memoir came out, uh, Rudolph's memoir, and she said, "quote Nazis got bad press." <laughs> she said the person that uh, that re- that wrote about him in negative ways must be a lying, drug addicted, fame seeking, money hungry, evil young man. Boy, I'm surprised. If, if is she still alive? I'm surprised the Trump campaign hasn't hired her. Hmm. God. Christ, her and her and Mussolini's fucking granddaughter can get together and, ugh. yeah. Um, I get it. You know, you maybe want to defend your dad, but there's plenty of children of Nazis that understand that their parents were fucking monsters. Hold on, Jason. Let me just let me just clarify this again. The she the, her father's uh, memoir. So one of his sons, his youngest younger son, youngest son. Sorry. Um, uh, anyway, there's some shit about him. He, he said he presented himself as a researcher determined to expose his grandfather's crimes. However, however, he's been accused of trading on his name and defrauding the families of Holocaust victims for financial gain. Um, but he also, uh, he also was, um, anyway, it's a complicated situation. So that's that's Hans Jürgen, who is the yeah. the in the movie is the youngest boy. Yes, that's his son. Yes, his uh, his son Rainier. So Haas's grandson. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Let's see here. So the oldest daughter died in twenty twenty. Wow, twenty twenty. The... Holy. Yeah, uh, Klaus, the oldest boy, died in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. Inga Bridget and Hans Jürgen and Anna Anna Gret are all still alive. All still alive, yeah. Okay, well, there you go. That's how, I mean, that's how, the the war was an extremely long time ago, but it also wasn't that long ago. They were also little children at that time, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. But that they're still alive, like that's, you know, that's crazy. Separate beds, Jason. As was the style at the time. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, he was the commander of the camp. If he wanted to push them together, who was going to tell him no? Yeah. Um, also, he clearly, I don't know if that was, a, I, I feel like that that may have been a um, an artistic choice on the director's part I mean, yeah, to facilitate to make it more cold. this kind of separation yeah. and make the wider shots. Because if they were in bed together, you would be, they'd be very close, would they not? And it also seemed like, you know, we were, we were getting some warmth and some love and whatever. Yeah. Which, which we don't have, in fact, in that no. scene. When they're they're talking, she brings up what was it that she brings up and starts laughing about that some guy had uh, what was he doing? I forget what it was something silly mm-hmm. uh, or cruel maybe even. But oh no, it was the guy that was playing. He was playing uh, accordion for the crows or something. And in my mind, I'm like, is she talking about like a like a Jewish prisoner or something? And she's like, oh, it was so funny. And she's laughing like a maniac. And he's just kind of smiling and they're laughing together over this thing that just feels like, again, no warmth there. Just just two ugh, just two just, monsters ugh. commiserating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, this <laughs> when they're complaining about like, you know, oh, it's it's warm out. Oh, you know, the blankets are so itchy, like stuff like that. I wrote down like this is the most first world problem conversation I think ever. Yeah. Where where someone <laughs> would complain about anything mundane. I mean, I know that's the point of the movie, but it's just insane. It's an insane thing to see and hear. 
Okay, question for you. Again, you're the war guy here, Jason. Um, so there's a, at the point where he goes in the lake and he finds like the piece of skeleton from the one mm-hmm. of the victims, one of the concentration camp victims, he calls um, one of the soldiers and starts speaking in code. Like he's saying, like, you know, the flowers can't grow here. And if you're going to take the, or you can't pick the flowers. And if you're going to pick the flowers, make sure you blow. blah, blah, blah. It's basically saying, like, uh, fix what happened. And why is he speaking in code? Wow. That's funny because, Brendan, I didn't even think about it in that way. I didn't even consider that he was like that he was like speaking in code. I just thought he was being a fucking fascist, just oh. a dumb fascist who was like, "Oh, you can't break the, you can't pick the flowers. You got to, you mean if you break them, so you're gonna pick them. You have to be a proper SS man and pick them properly so it doesn't damage it." But I think you're probably right. I think that's what he was and doing. And why why would they speak in code, Brendan? Because they didn't want because like that was one of the big things was they weren't supposed to like talk about it openly, like. They were trying to keep, like, even though this was clearly something that was happening, they didn't really want the world to know about it. So maybe, I maybe mean, like, they. At least still it was done. They weren't talking about it openly, like, especially maybe over oh. a phone line, right? Like, like, when, when, when the war ended, there was an attempt made to destroy as many documents as they could, especially the stuff in relation to, like, the, the Vansi conference mm. and the, the Holocaust and all that. And, Thankfully, a lot of it did survive. In fact, with the Vansi conference, I think as we learned during the conspiracy episode, one copy of the minutes from that meeting survived. Yeah. So we know what happened. And that's literally the reason we, that's literally the main reason we know the Holocaust yeah. existed. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, or at least how it started anyways. We know yeah. like, how it actually was established. I mean, we, we cer- knew it happened. Yeah, we certainly had enough pictures and footage to know that it happened. But that was, that was mm-hmm. the, that was the uh, damning document implicating those yeah. responsible to show that it was like an in, I mean obviously it was intentional but this clearly laid out that it was an intentionally planned thing. Yes. Well yeah, I don't th- yeah, it'd be pretty hard to prove it was unintentional, Jason. <laughs> well, it was an accident on our part. Yeah. Look, we were making camps because people like to go to camps and also you showed up to the camps and we were like, "Oh, you guys can hang out here." And then there was some gas accident. Oh, no, I don't like any of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean and yeah, it's just such a horrible thing to think about, isn't it? You know, it really is. Man, notes, right? We got notes, Brendan. We got notes. Uh, I wrote, "He's cheating um, on his wife." What a monster! Yeah, what a monster! <laughs> Actually, I had the moment though near the uh, at one point in the movie when he uh, knows he's getting transferred. He goes out to the stable and he talks to his horse for me. He's like, "Look, man, I love you." Nobody's going to be as cool as you. I'm like, "Oh, but he loves his horse. He's a good guy." I was hoping they were going to cut to him <laughs> trying to fuck the horse. Oh, that would have been something. That would have been, uh, yeah. I know. I mean, I, I mean, I know Glazer is a man to take artistic license if he needs it, but that might have been just a little much. I mean, not that anybody would have complained about Haas fucking a horse, but it just, I don't think there's any historical evidence to that effect. I think he had the documents burned. Yeah. I thought it was an interesting choice that they had, that Glazer had him reading Hansel and Gretel to his kids, especially the part that we hear him talk about where they shove the witch into the oven. And cook the witch. I was like, "Oh, that's all right." And 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 I I mean, would I be would I be wrong in assuming that they would the Nazis would probably see Hansel and Gretel and the witch as like a Jewish stereotype? You know, witches have like long noses Possible. and all this shit. I'm sure the Nazis of all people twisted fairy tales to their own uses. I mean, Hansel and Gretel is a is a classic German fairy tale. You know, the Hans Christian Andersen shit, mm-hmm. right? Uh, that 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 uh, HCA shit, the real shit, and listen, uncut. And shit. listen, I'm not saying it was initially conceived of as a uh, anti anti Semitic piece of literature, but I'm saying I feel like that could easily be construed as such. That Brendan also, it may not have been conceived as an anti Semitic piece of literature, but there's also a good chance that it was conceived of as an anti Semitic piece of literature. True. just for the just for the time. I don't know that HCA was an anti Semite, but. Everybody hated Jews a little bit back then because it was just the thing to do, right? It's like, well, we have to hate someone. It may as well be them. <laughs> Weirdly enough, though, Hans Christian Andersen, Satanist. Yeah, I loved him. Loved him. One of the creepier scenes in this movie, not for its horrific thing, but is after he fucks that girl, he goes down to his uh, murder basement and washes his dick off. Oh, yeah, that was that was upsetting. <laughs> I mean, he's a considerate guy. I mean, yeah, if, if you're going to cheat, the least you could do is wash your dick off. But going down to the murder basement to do it does seem 
um, just uh, just really out there. Rudolph Hess, dot, Man. dot, dot, a considerable, a considerate guy, Jason McCloud. <laughs> considerate guy. He really considers his wife by washing his the stank off his uh, cheating Also, dick. like, that's not how you prevent STIs. <laughs> no, it's not. No, that's just how you prevent your wife from noticing. I mean, she didn't know that he was fucking Polish girls? I don't know. I mean, she must have had to assume... But also, look at her life. She's not gonna. She's not gonna rock the boat. She has everything she wants, right? Yeah, you're really gonna. You're really gonna try to divorce that fucking guy. Ugh, good luck. Yeah, exactly. Did you notice, Brendan, that when our when the little boy Hans Jürgen is sitting in his room, and he's playing with some dice, and he rolls the dice? Did you notice what the dice came up? No. All sixes, baby. Three of them. Oh wow. <laughs> I just because I saw the dice land, I'm like, I paused for a second. I'm like, I got to see what those dice read. It was like, yep, six, six, six. I just sent you a picture, Jason. It's a real picture I just found of his kids by the camp, uh, by the camp, like in their yard, and that, that's just haunting alone. That picture is just yeah. scary on its own. It's yeah. such an innocent looking picture of these four children, and in the background, you see the fucking ga- the wall. Well, I don't know if that's like the camp wall simply because I don't see any barbed wire on top of it, but I wouldn't be surprised if, like, to the left of the photographer, yeah, that's where the camp wall is. It's just like, so horrifying. Like, God. Yeah. Yeah, these are just kids, man, just living their lives, and Christ. Hmm. Oh, man. Nazis suck. I think if, if anything, uh, if anybody can pull any kind of summary from this, it's that Nazis suck. Yeah. One little interesting thing I noticed, too, was there was a bit, at least it, maybe it was a practice, but there was a benefit that was going on for wounded soldiers because we see like some guy, some a band set up. And I think the I don't know if these guys are like World War One vets or if they're just wearing like surplus World War One uniforms, but they've got kind of the World War One style hats mm-hmm. that we've saw in um, All Quiet in the Western Front and various other movies. And they're and they're playing music and there are two extremely at least one extremely injured ss soldier and another one sitting in the audience watching them one guy's like burned to shit yeah uh what else we got here yeah yeah that's pretty much all i've got there um i just thought it was interesting showing that particular hallway in the in the holocaust museum with all the shoes Mm. and all the luggage uh and just those things such personal things that can make such connection that you look at that and it's just like every pair of shoes in there is a person you know every suitcase is a family yeah and just the fact that we just see people like just casually cleaning the museum you know like i mean i think it's very important that museum exists because i think we need to be i mean we need to never forget about this absolutely no ashwitz needs to stay there 100 percent um but it's like is it contrasting it it's like because they're just going about their job right they're cleaning the museum Mm -hmm. That's the banality of their life. They're they're experiencing this banality amidst this memorial to evil. It's true. In their own way. I mean, which obviously is, I'm not comparing it to the banality of just mm. being a German in the system or anything, but like kind of, I feel like there's a contrast. There. Yeah, no, I, I mean, certainly we're not saying these poor cleaner, these cleaners at the museum are like complicit in anything. But no, in fact, if anything, they're they're heroes for helping to keep this place running and and open to the world. Right. And it's like, you know, uh, I'm sure at some point, you know, you know, maybe when you start there, you're like, oh, fuck. Like, here's the thing, Jason. I think this is it. When you start, (laughs) if you start a job at this kind of place, I'm sure the first week is fucking brutal. Like the first few weeks, maybe the the first month, you know, because you're you're seeing this every single day. But I think just Mm -hmm. like. Just like the families, in only this way, just like the families that yeah. were, you know, living in that place right next to Auschwitz, eventually you just get used to it. Maybe that's the you comparison. You get to it, yeah. Exactly. That it's like, yeah, you work at this center and, and it would be hard on anybody for a little while, but at a certain point you have to kind of nure yourself to it or you're going to go crazy. And maybe that's the scariest part of, it, of all of it, is that yeah. eventually these that's people the- got used to it as if it was like an everyday part of their lives. Yeah, yeah, really, humans' ability to be complicit in such horror so easily and with such, like, lack of emotion and friend of mine, connection. friend of mine told me something. that We were actually talking about this movie today, and he told me that um, the most comforting thing he's ever heard kind of discussed about this is that we'll never truly we – can, we can logistically understand how everything kind of led this way, but as human beings, we'll never truly understand how this happened. And no. – he said that is the most comforting thing to know that we will never quite understand the horrors that it took to get yeah. to this point. 
that's a a blessing to us really as humans yeah yeah i mean you know it but at the same time you know it's it is good that we haven't but we can't forget no. what happened and we can't ever 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 let it happen again and too many times in this world echoes of this happen and people are killed for no reason other than who they are or where they happen to live exactly and it fucking sucks to sit here in the west and and enjoy all the all the fruits of imperialism mm-hmm. and feel helpless but you know maybe i'm not that helpless maybe i'm just a piece of shit that's happy to sit here and get fat and happy and enjoy it well, on that note, Jason, um, <laughs> I'm going to move on and talk about a couple other things about right. this movie. Um, I really don't have a lot because, again, this is a brand new movie. But I will uh, note that Sandra Hewler um, had vowed to never play a Nazi in a movie. She said that's the one role I never want to take on because she she said, and as we kind of danced around this earlier, is that when actors play um, Nazis, it often comes across maybe unintentionally, but looking a bit glamorous, Mm. like looking kind of quote unquote cool or like, you know, anyway, she didn't, but that that was her worry. She's like, I never want to make it look like that. I never want to do that. But Jonathan Glazer convinced her. He's like, this is a very unglamorous role. You're not even going to, I'm not even going to do a fucking close up. Okay, babe. And uh, he did his Dennis Miller impression and that's what sold her. No, she said, but she agreed to do it because she trusted him as a filmmaker. um, But she did say that it was a very challenging shoot. Um, because again, you got to live in this character and that is, that is Mm. something that is a lot to put on someone. (laughs) Um, the, I was going to say most like the Nazis that appear in the movie, like, yeah, nobody, (laughs) nobody's interesting. Nobody's charismatic. Everybody's functional for the, for the role that they are. And they're there. Like they're just there. But I mean, the performances are great, but they're, they're great in a way, in a way that's not distracting. Yeah, I mean, because like again, if we if we compare this to conspiracy, as banal as Branna's um, Hadrick was, Branna is so compelling on screen, and even when he's and and Hadrick was a charismatic character mm-hmm. to some extent, right? And Branna does show that, and you can't help but like that guy. In comparison, um, uh, the the gentleman playing Hess here is there's no charisma there. There's pure function, pure pragmatism. He's just functionally evil. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I you probably already know this, but I'll tell the folks. Uh, th- this does kind of m- at least make me feel a little bit. Uh, not I wouldn't say joy, but maybe satisfaction is that when he when Rudolf Hess was executed, they did hang him on a gallows outside the entrance to the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Oh, very good. So, very good. Yeah, appropriate. Per- well, because it was in Poland, so yes, absolutely. That that was a perfect spot to do it. Um. Can I mention one thing that is uh, not as satisfying, of course, is mm. Hess being hanged uh, until he died, right. but uh, is kind of interesting to me. Because I noticed he, so we see Hess in uniform through most of the movie, and he's wearing your typical decorations of, of being a Nazi. Uh, he's got an Iron Cross on there from the First World War, I think. And um, But he's got a what looks like a, a weird red star on, on his... Um, I think it's on his right breast. And I think to myself, well, I know Red Star is uh, from the Soviet military, but there's no fucking way an SS guy is wearing a Soviet decoration. No, turns out it's from the First World War. He has an Iron Crescent, which is an award that was given out by the Ottoman Empire, which was an ally of the German Empire in World War I. Oh. And I've never seen that medal before. I'd never heard tell of it. And again, I'm not like an expert or anything you know, on medals, but... I just thought that was interesting that he had that medal for for various gallantry and bravery in the in the first one. You're not an expert on medals like the people wear, but you are an expert on metals like uh, heavy um, steel, uh, yeah. copper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, even nickel. I like nickel. nickel. Can't. We're taking nickel back, from what I've heard. Yeah, that's that's the plan. We're we're taking it back from <laughs> those guys. We're taking nickel back. Yep. Okay. Yep. Bet you didn't. Bet you did. <laughs> bet you didn't think you'd hear a sexy back reference on the Zone of Interest episode, <sighs> folks. Here we are. Folks. Um, okay, well, let's get into the and we have a little bit of extra thing here at the end, but I just want to go through this quick. This movie obviously is getting critical acclaim across the board. Rotten Tomatoes has a ninety-three percent with an average rating of eight point seven out of ten. 
Um, and of course, it's a new movie, so there's 315 reviews. This is a genuinely very high uh, rating on there. Um, the consensus reads, Dispassionately examining the ordinary existence of people complicit in horrific crimes, the zone of interest forces us to take a cold look at the mundan- mundanity behind an unforgivable brutality. Um, the- Do you think, Brendan, that if Gene Shalit was still alive and reviewed oh, this movie, the headline the headline would have been the zone of interesting? I hope not. I really hope not. <laughs> um, the zone kept my interest. Yeah, yeah, terrible. Um, <laughs> So David Ehrlich of IndieWire praised Glazer's uh, camera process for instilling a flattening evenness into a film where the lack of drama becomes deeply sickening unto itself. Uh, Daily Telegraph said, through painstaking framing and sound design, its horrors gnaw at the edge of every shot. Uh, Filmmaker Steven Spielberg, you may have heard of him. uh, Uh, Have I? What's he done? uh, uh, He's the one who did um, 1941. 1941. Oh, was that the guy that did Always? Yeah, Always. The Always director. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. He made a couple movies. Um, He called this movie the best Holocaust film ever made. Um, He said, it's doing a lot of good work in raising awareness, especially about the banality of evil. Uh, Filmmaker Todd Field also praised the movie, said, for those familiar with Glazer's films, it's no surprise his approach here is unencumbered by tropes, genre conceits, or the cinematic shorthand we often take for granted. Over his 24-year career as one of our finest filmmakers, Glazer has consistently executed high-wire interpretations of genre and in the process completely reinvented them. Crime, Sexy Beast, The Paranormal, Birth, Science Fiction, Under the Skin. His pictures within these frames are mind-blowingly unique as if he'd never seen anything that had been done before. That's a really good way to put it. Uh, Wait, wait, wait. Do you think, and uh, stick with me here, do you think it's possible that Jonathan Glazer is a space alien and that under the skin was actually autobiographical. I hope so. Yeah. Folks, I'm saying it right now. I'm calling it Jonathan Glazer, the first alien to make contact with earth. And what did he do? He made a solid movie career making, I mean, a very solid movie, accessible art movies though. I would say. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So I do want to mention, um, this, uh, one of the most negative reviews, um, unfortunately from Richard Brody, (laughs) From the New Yorker, okay. <laughs> we're, like, uh, we're going over to the Daily Stormer. Yeah, uh, let's talk about what do they think of this. Let's movie. take a look at what Armand White is saying. No, <laughs> uh, Richard Brody from the New Yorker wrote, "This movie is an extreme form of hollow kitsch. It's this year's Jojo Rabbit, which has a lot going on because number one, love Jojo Rabbit. I think it's a great movie. Yeah, me too. Hollow kitsch. Come on, kitsch. Are you kidding me? That is the last I think that's, thing." Uh, yeah. That's a very broad generalization, and I would say a generalization about broads. <laughs> Richard Brody um, is a, is kind of a weird one. Anyway, um, the Oscars have already happened when you're listening to this, but we have no idea if it won anything. But I will tell you, Jason, um, actually, if you want to guess, it is nominated for five Oscars this year. Ooh. So I assume it's in the running for Best Picture. Yes. Because uh, they get 10, right? Um, yep. uh Best Director. Yep. Jonathan Glazer, uh, yep. Best Adapted Screenplay. Yep, Jonathan Glazer again. Uh, Two more. Best Cinematography? No. One more guess. Best Sound. Yes, Best Sound. You want, oh, I'll give you one more guess, Jason. Get that last one. I feel like it, uh, Best best uh, Non-English Film, Best Foreign Film. Yes, exactly. Okay. Best yeah, I International I, Feature I, Film. I, I always feel bad when international actors don't get any love. It's unfortunate, but... Mm-hmm. I mean, they are international actors. All these people. No, what I mean, like, like that they don't get any nominations. Oh yeah, I know, I know. Uh, I feel like Sandra Hewler could have gotten a nomination. Absolutely. Um, well, I'll tell you though, the BAFTAs have already happened, um, and it was nominated for Best Director, but that went to Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer. Mm-hmm. It was not. It was uh, Best Adapted Screenplay, but that went to Cord Jefferson for American Fiction, which is a great movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, supporting actress Sandra Hewler was nominated, but it went to Divine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers, very well deserved. Um, Best Cinematography, which went to Oppenheimer. Best Editing, which went to Oppenheimer, and Best Production Design, which went to Poor Things. But it did win. For Outstanding British Film, Best Film Not in the English Language, and Best Sound. Yeah, I, I think that this, if, if this movie doesn't win Best Sound, I will be extremely surprised. I mean, I feel like Oppenheimer is a very close one for that. Really? But, 
I mean, but I feel like Op- I feel like Oppenheimer is going to get a lot of the big ones. So it'd be nice to like see it's... Zone of Interest. I feel like Zone of Interest definitely has a chance at the best foreign foreign language film. Oh, I uh, think it's pretty much got that one in the bag. I yeah, think. Uh, uh, and best, like I say, I hope best sound, best adapted screenplay. I don't know. I don't know what else is out there. But yeah, I, I, I don't <laughs> think it's. I don't. It is a true dark horse for the. I, l- I love. I love how we're talking about. We're speculating right now. People are like, "You fucking idiots!" Yeah, exactly. shit. <laughs> Doesn't mean shit. Well, w- what date is the Oscars? Uh, it would have been uh, uh, yesterday, the, right? So I believe, I believe <laughs> would have been no. <laughs> I believe would have been last week. Last week, I believe it was a week ago. Okay. Yeah. Um. Anyway, this movie, I I couldn't get great information on the financials, but it it would cost around fifteen million dollars, and right now it's made about it's made about twenty million dollars. So, but Jason, like how much? before we go, about twenty. I mean, it's not exactly a crowd pleaser. No. Before we go any further, though, I did grab some uh, some quick reviews some, from some listeners here. We're going to go through these real quick. I just wanted to get kind of a an idea of uh, what some of the people's thought about this. And it's been a while since we've done comments, so it's nice to hear from the people once more to know they're still out there. Exactly. Uh, okay, so Patrick C. Taylor says, this this movie reminded me of Gene Dealman um, in the way that what we're often seeing is just the quotidian events of family life, but the story is really about what the camera is not showing you. It gives you so little as a way of demanding your attention to when the important details creep in from the edge of the frame. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's like It's like the notes that they're not playing that really matter. It's true. But Even no, though you absolutely. said that in the worst fucking, I know I, I sounded character. like I was mocking him, but no, he's absolutely right. Like, yeah, it's it's your it's what you're not seeing that is the scariest thing. <laughs> it's what you're not seeing. No, take that out. Cut that. Cut that. <laughs> nope. No, that is staying in. Cut that. You are terrible. not living that down. That's horrible. Uh, I hate it. Uh, our next comment, Brennan, comes from one Mark Kaiserman. Wow, oh. impressive, Kaiser. Don't make like any more Kais- comments. The on Kaiser that. of Germany, right? Kaiser uh, Soze. Uh, Herr Kaiserman writes, I respect no, it. Jason, that's terrible. That's just German for Mr. Given its okay. acclaim, I actually went and saw it a second time. Oh, man, you are, uh, I respect you. That's ballsy. To understand what I had missed, it is an expertly crafted film throughout, especially the sound, but it didn't engage me. And the motherfucker saw it twice, Brendan. Yeah. The idea that Nazis were people with their own families and lives outside being mass murderers isn't something new. Just read Hannah Arendt on the banality of evil. I am somewhat surprised by the widespread acclaim for the film. Wow. I mean, hey, you, you, you can't argue that the guy earned his dislike of the film honestly by seeing it twice. <laughs> I mean, he gave it a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Oxenham Allen says, I think we're all familiar with the concept of the banality of evil, but actually seeing a loving family live it is quite impactful. To me, it's more about how people are willing to let others suffer if it benefits them directly, which is a message that I think still resonates today. The sound design is incredible, as well as the production design and cinematography. Yeah. Like, the cinematography really gave me, like, a bit of a Kubrick vibe, Mm. where a lot of scenes, and especially, like, a lot of scenes were always in focus, like, the whole frame was in focus. Again, the very static shots... Uh, uh, maybe if, if Wes Anderson was super depressed might be a way to describe it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Cause it's not pretty like a Wes no. Anderson movie, but it's, but the way that he makes it intentionally, it, like he, the way he makes it intentionally look drab makes it look good. Yeah. If it weirdly. Our next comment, Brendan comes from Lindsay Dunn hmm. who writes, I've seen it twice. God damn it. These people, these are hardcore. I feel this is one movie you can't appreciate without an excellent sound system. I saw it the first time on the screener I had. Couldn't hear half the noises happening that make it interesting. Still, I'm in shock. Uh, Still, I'm shocked that the score gets so much attention because if you time out how much music is in the movie, I bet it's only about 15 minutes. There's not much music in it. It's a chilling concept for a film, but I left unsatisfied. What am I supposed to get out of it? I suppose the concept could be that the world is full of cruel things and people who are suffering... And they are sometimes literally right past the fence. Don't inoculate yourself. I personally got that same message and more effectively in the underappreciated movie Origin. I'm not familiar. A scene where the kids stand around a pool while one boy is treated cruelly and publicly and everyone just lets it happen. You can just as well ask yourself, where are you standing around a pool letting injustice happen? Interesting movie, but didn't do it for me. Origin is another movie that just came out uh, this past year. 
Okay. I also haven't seen it, but I like to get these di- different perspectives, Jason. You know, I, I see these people's points, and, and I think there is a, like, I, I think if this movie had been even made more like the book, it would be more in this ve- vein, but there's something mm-hmm. about we in the West. We just like seeing movies with people with Nazi uniforms on. We really do. Yeah. Uh, and it, it is, yes, it's obviously something that's been fetishized and exploited and uh, used in such a way. It's almost like the movie is trying to make you feel bad that you want to watch the movie. But yeah. I mean that in a good way. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think mean you're right. I think you're right. And it should. Uh, S.C. Williams Holt, Sergeant Charger, says, Historical horror. As if it all happened exactly this way. The slime of humanity posing as ignorant beauty. The horror disguised, allowing Glazer to slowly unwind the depravity. A fresh nightmare awaiting the viewer in each scene, juxtaposed by the gorgeous Auschwitz countryside. The disgust swells within you until you're dizzied into a state of nausea. To know these events happened is not enough without knowing how casual the hatred is, how willful the genocide. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's it, the casualness of it. Like, these people aren't always frothing at the mouth, screaming that the Jews uh, uh, must have their blood spilled. Like, this is just no. like... Not I mean, they time. were, but not all. I mean, always. they were, but not all the time. Other yeah. times they're just like, yeah, it's a good day to kill the Jews, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it just, it really, I think it's important to show these things like this because I think it. you need to see... I think you need to see this. I think you need to see how... Um, like the banality of evil. I don't know any other other way to say it. You think evil doesn't all evil isn't always overtly obvious. I guess yeah. and it can be you quiet. May be a part of it without even realizing. Yeah, if you don't have if you don't have the personal like ability to be introspective and and to take a look at what you're doing and, and how you're contributing. Jason, did Sharon Horwath see this movie? Sharon uh, did write in, and Sharon writes, "I'm planning on seeing it." in the next week or so when the theaters near me do their best picture showing. So we will expect an update from Sharon. What she Jason, thinks. I have an update right now. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> Sharon, Sharon, I hope you don't mind and I hope you don't get sued, but I'm going to read Sharon's letterbox review. Um, she says, after trying to see this movie for months, I have now seen zone of interest of the, of the best picture nominees. It is not my favorite, but it is incredibly effective at what it is trying to achieve. Sandra Hewler and Christian Friedel are both great. And the very end of the movie, you'll see which part I mean, was the closest I got to actually crying. Nice. There we go. There we go. This just in three stars for Madam Webb from Dan McCoy. Oh, wow. That's a. Generous rating. I think Dan must have enjoyed himself. Uh, do you think he? Uh, do you think he uh, got off on those spiders? You think? That's I'll give Madam Web this. It totally gets to the fireworks factory. Is what he said. <laughs> I love a you, review that is nothing but a Simpsons joke. I mean, there's more <laughs> to, in it, but that's the only part I read. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Yeah. So this is a movie that is a little bit divisive in our comments. Uh, but not. But certain. But certainly not like in general the consensus i think it it seems that the and let me just make it clear i cherry picked you know yeah. comments on both sides cuz i want to i want to get both sides of it but jason why don't you, you uh, why don't you wrap this thing up first here and uh and tell us what you thought about overall uh this movie this is a chilling movie this is um this is definitely a, a great companion piece i think to other holocaust movies i wouldn't necessarily want to watch it on its own but you know, if you've seen Schindler's List, throw this on afterwards because you're already not depressed enough. So let's make it a full night, right? Um, I can't believe you yeah. just suggested a Schindler's List zone of interest double feature. It's a long night. It's a long, depressing night. But uh, you know what? It'll be worth it. To, and to be fair, this movie is only an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. No. Schindler's exactly. List is the one that's like three hours. <laughs> Absolutely. Um I mean, hey, if, if Steven Spielberg says it's the best Holocaust movie ever made, I mean, that's a pretty strong endorsement. <laughs> I'd say, yeah. Um, no, I, I, I did like this. Uh, I think everybody should see it. Uh, I think it's beautifully made. I think it's scary. Not mm. in the uh, uh, jump scare sort of way, but just in the, the simmering dread, the fear that you could be part of the system at some point and not even realize it or at worst care, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I feel right giving this movie a rating. I'll just say that, you know what, see it. It's it's necessary. Mm-hmm. Well, I will uh, I will say I think this is one of the best movies about this subject. I think that this is, 
This this th- as much and it's weird for me to say this about a PG thirteen movie about the Holocaust, but this movie really does pull no punches and it makes you feel feel shitty for watching it which it yeah. should it, yes. you should not you should not be enjoying this movie in 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 the in the traditional sense i yeah. mean i know a lot of people really like this movie and i really really like this movie mm-hmm. but not in the traditional way where i'm like i'm having a good time drinking some beers with my buddies you know yeah. this yeah. is this is a movie to experience and and go through all those um emotions and it's difficult and it, it's difficult to grapple that you're watching a movie dealing with a horrifying time period in human history and showing just how banal it was. Like, again, we're going back to the word banal, but that's what it is. It's showing just how banal, how everyone treated it that way, everyone around it. It's certainly not the people in the camp, but certainly people living around it and certainly the families. Let's also say, I haven't mentioned this yet, but let's also say these people were bored because living in Nazi Germany wasn't any fun because fun was banned. All the good shit, all the jazz, and all the cool art, and all the all the sexy fun times. It was all banned. So these people had nothing to do but be fascist pricks. I mean, it's it's kind of true. It was a lot of censorship. So, mm-hmm. I mean, we talked about All Quiet on the Western Front being thrown out of Germany, essentially, when, when the Nazis came to power. And we'll come back to that later when we talk about another movie related to that. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I, it's, I think it's, uh, uh, Jonathan Glazer does it again. What more yeah. can I say? He's a fantastic filmmaker. I feel like I really need to go back and watch um, Birth again. I think I've seen it. I've seen it once, okay. and from all accounts I've heard, it's it's also really good. And that, and if that's the case, that means he hasn't made a single bad movie, <laughs> which is wow. pretty impressive. Even even having only made four movies, like it's still pretty impressive. I mean, geez, even. Even George Lucas made uh, Howard the Duck. Even George Lucas, arguably many, many movies. <laughs> At least two. <laughs> At least maybe three. Arguably four. <laughs> uh, well, there you go. That's that's the episode. But Jason, next week I was gonna say we're gonna get, we're gonna get to something a little less depressing. I mean, it is maybe, but. Maybe not. I mean, we're not gonna we're not gonna get something quite as heavy as a uh, zone of interest. But next week, Jason, we are gonna continue our journey of and now for something completely similar. You remember when we watched Platoon? Yeah, I did. I remember that yeah. movie. Well, Oliver Stone. I don't know if you know this. He made another Vietnam War movie. Did he? He did, and it was called Born on the Fourth of July, my oh, friend. Oh yeah, that one. This is the is a movie starring Tom Cruise as uh, Ron Kovic. Uh, so this is basically the biography of Ron Kovic. Paralyzed in the Vietnam War, he becomes an anti-war and pro-human rights political activist after feeling betrayed by the country he fought for. Is Sean That's Penn we... in this movie? No, you're thinking of Casualties of War. That's the one Michael J. Fox, isn't it? Mm, and Sean Penn, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will get to that one eventually. That's the other Vietnam War movie that Oliver Stone made. He had a bit of a niche for a while. <laughs> yeah. It's, you do do what you know, I guess, right? I guess so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, born on the fourth of July. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. And it's uh, completely similar because it's another Oliver Stone Vietnam movie. So there you go. Uh, Jason, you've never seen it, right? No, I have not. Oh, interesting. Okay, I can't wait to see what you think. I'm um, yeah. So we'll talk about that next week. Um, but until then, we're all over the place. We're on social media. You can find us uh, by searching for for screen. I'm going to you can find us on Twitter and Blue Sky at FSAC Pod, as in for screen. And Gundre. Podcast. You can also find our home base, our podcast home base, if you want to listen to our dumbasses, uh, at uh, ageofradio.org slash for screen. And Gundre. Or you can search for us on whatever podcast platform you are using. Uh, they seem to, some of them seem to be going the way of the dodo, but. Uh, Uh, There's still lots of them out there, and we're on 99% of them, I'd say. Uh, We're not on on Breitbart Radio yet. Um, I am working on it. Um, Talking to Benny Boy, seeing if he can uh, get a good word in for me. Yeah, I tried to remember remember that other company's name. uh, Daily Caller? Daily Wire? That's the one, but it, it 
thankfully jason it's not in my brain i i like that uh i i, I kind of like that that i didn't That's, think of it yeah that, that, that proves that you're a a, a decent human being Oh, thanks. But that's it. And Jason, what about you? Where are you at? Uh, you can find me on the ads at Jason D. McLeod. That's M-A-C-L-E-O-D. Cool. But that brings us to the end of our gathering here, our talk about the zone of interest. So in the spirit of that, I have one last thing to say to Brendan, which is God save the king. I'm Dennis the Menace with my sling. Not appropriate on an episode about a Holocaust movie. And for Screen and Country, I'm Jason. I'm Brendan, and I thought that was appropriate because it was the furthest thing from the Holocaust that I could mention. Uh, well, okay, I'll give you that. I mean, I guess if you'd have done a Holocaust pun, it probably wouldn't have been very appropriate. No. No. Well, so... Bye, folks. Adios. For Screen and Country was created by and stars Brendan Wall and Jason McLeod. Today's film was The Zone of Interest, released in 2023. This has been an Age of Radio production, copyright 2024.